It says, be not afraid of sudden fear, neither the desolation of the wicked when it comes. Amen. For the Lord shall be your confidence and shall keep your foot from being taken. Amen. That word afraid means to revere. Listen closely. To revere, to stand in awe, to honor, to respect, to terrify. Be not afraid of sudden fear. Honor, respect, revere what's going on here. What the Spirit of God is saying, because of the terror of something that's coming, don't give it a higher place in your heart. Don't be overwhelmed by it. Don't be in awe. You can be terrified and still be in awe. You can be terrified and say, oh, I respect its deadliness. God says, no, don't. Be not in reverence of. Be not honoring, respecting, or standing in awe of this coronavirus. And it says, be not afraid of sudden fear, the kind that comes up instantly. Bang, there it is. Which is pretty much the way it's been happening. Once people decided to take it serious, uh, seriously, that's about the only thing you could find on any channel of television. Instant awe of in fear brings a terrifying respect, and so you have to refuse it. Fear is not an emotion. Fear is a spirit. Did you know that? The spirit of fear. I don't know about you, but if a, if a demon spirit comes up and tries to get me to react, my first thought is, what? I'm not, no. No, this is not right what you're trying to get me to do. He's trying to get a foothold. He's trying to get a foothold. I got spirit-filled Christians who believe in healing, who prepare every season that there's cold season or flu season to get it. And do you know how I know? I get it every year. I get it every year. I get it every year. Want me to tell you why you get it every year? Because you say you get it every year. Thus shall your word be that goes forth out of your mouth. It shall not return unto you void, but it'll prosper, accomplish what you please and prosper in the thing you've sent it. In other words, every year you do that, the flu or the cold you get is going to be better than the one before. And I don't mean better for your benefit. You need to shut your mouth and rebuke the devil. He also says, though, not to be afraid of the desolation of the wicked. I hate to tell you this, y'all. Judgment on the planet from God is attached to this virus. I agree. Now, oh, but grace. Grace. There's God, there is no judgment. Oh, I'm sorry, there is. Just because we have a new covenant, judgment is lifted off those who buy into the covenant. But the world is still judged. God waits, and he waits, and he waits. But you know when the cup of iniquity gets filled, he has to do something. How many babies? 66 million. 66 million babies aborted in the United States, and God's not going to judge? Oh, well, no, he's going to wait. No, he's not. Why? So another 66 million can be aborted? Oh, after they're born? I'm not going to stick on this, but I think you get my point. The word desolation means to ravage, to ruin, to waste, and to destroy the wicked. Hello? You said, but what about all the innocent people? There are no innocent people. There are no innocent people. If you're born again, 
You're, you're made innocent by the blood. But before you got born again, you can declare yourself innocent. Well, what about their children? You blame the parents. If the children are affected, you blame the parents. And well, let's get down to brass tacks. This is the word of God. We've got people who aren't here today out of fear of the virus, by the way. Hmm. The Bible says perfect love casts out fear. But God promised us the Lord shall be our confidence and shall keep our foot from being taken. What does it mean, keep your foot from being taken? It's interesting because one of the definition of that is walking and the other is big toe. You know that thing you slam into in the middle of the night when the lights are off. He'll even keep your big toe from getting slammed. He'll, that it, it also means he'll guard and protect and save your life from being taken captive, caught in a noose. You notice, notice it says caught. How do you get the flu? You catch it. At least in America, that's the word we use. The message said he'll keep you safe and sound. The terror we have to watch out for generally doesn't come in the daytime either. We have our faculties about us. We have telephones. We have people around us, people we can talk to. We can encourage each other. It's about 11 o'clock at night if you wake up out of a sound sleep and you sense fear or you sense something's not right and you hear a voice whispering, you know you're susceptible. You know you're susceptible. How do you know you already haven't come in contact? My medical people here, do me a favor and stop thinking medically when it comes to this. This is a spiritual battle. Because if you continue to think medically, you're shooting your faith in the foot every time. Because you're taught to look at percentages, you're taught to, you're taught to look at inevitabilities, you're, you're taught to look at germs as being more powerful than God. You may not realize that, but, oh, we don't have a vaccine for that yet. I'm sorry, but if you're a believer, you do. Amen. Resist the devil and he'll flee from you. We need to get smart. Now, understand, the Bible does tell us this. that wisdom and knowledge walk hand in hand. You have the knowledge of what you're dealing with and, and what you need to do in the natural to keep yourself protected, but you also have the wisdom of God which makes sure that every nook, cranny, and crack or thing you forgot about is covered, is, is covered because it overshadows it all. So be smart. Be smart. You say, well, pastor, what if I have to be where people are? No evil shall befall you. No plague come near your dwelling. How many of you know who John G. Lake is or have ever heard that name? John G. Lake, one of the greatest, one of the greatest faith healers, one of the greatest missionaries of the last century, of actually the, the early part of the 20th century. The bubonic plague was ravaging the world. He was down in, in Africa. He went down to Africa where it was very terrible. Uh, you know the ship Hope, Red Cross? They had, the British had a medical ship there uh, taking care of them. And he went on to the ship to, to assist them and pray for people. And, and they told him, no, if you come on, you know, there's no guarantee you may get it, Mr. Lake. And he walked, he says, take me to one of your worst cases. They took him over, and he, he, he looked at them, and the plague also affects your lungs. Interesting, so does the corona. And he said f f blood was coming out of his mouth, foaming froth from this. And he said, are there a lot of germs in that froth? He said, oh, yeah, there's enough germs in that froth to, to kill this whole city. 
I said, really? So I want you to scoop that off and put it in the palm of my hand. They said, no, we, you're, you're going to die. He said, do you have a microscope? I said, you bring it here. They brought the microscope over. I said, now, either you do it or I'll do it. You take, so that, you know, use the old wooden tongue depressor, scooped it, probably did it like this, and, and put a huge amount of it on his hand. And he stuck his hand under the microscope. And he said, now, I want you to look. Now, this is documented by the physicians, not just his story. British don't like to lie, especially if they have to sign their name to it. And he put it under that microscope, and he says, I want you to tell me what's happening right now. And they looked at it, and they said, my God, my God. He said, what's going on? He said, every time a germ touches your skin, it dies instantly. And he said, do you know why that is? Because greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. How many here have that same level of faith as John Lake? Let me see your hands. Shame on you. Every single person, please raise your hands. Everybody, raise your hands. Did you have faith to get saved? Now keep your hand up. Keep your hand up. If you had faith to get saved, keep your hand up. Okay. The greatest miracle that will ever take place in your entire life took place with you being born again. You had a dead going to hell spirit. God resurrected it and now you're a, you're a citizen of heaven. The Bible says it's the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead that lives in you. Don't ever say you don't have faith for something. The problem is you don't have faith in your faith. You hope. So I'm going to use no weapon formed against me shall prosper. That's what goes on inside. Amen. By his stripes, not yours. Now, he also, the interesting thing, and I love about it, and we're going to go to Psalm 91 now. I want you, everybody, to turn to Psalm the 91st. Get over here, Dave. It's my favorite. My wife and I, for years and years and years, until just recently, we kind of let it skip for a little bit. While we started our day reciting Psalm 91. I went into a lot of different stuff uh, with the people Thursday night, so this is... Psalm 91, verse 5 says this, You shall not be afraid of the terror by night, nor the arrow that flies by day. You shall not be afraid of the terror by night. The Bible says that terror by night is gloom. Now listen to this. And twisted adversity. This germ has been twisted in a chemical lab. Isn't that interesting? Psalm 91. How long ago was that written? And God was dealing with twisted microbes. And he said, you're not going to be afraid of twisted adversary. Nor for pestilence. That word nor means not because of pestilence, which is plague, disease. And a word I'd never heard used before. Actually, I'd never heard of the word before. Definition of that is murrain, M-U-R-R-A-I-N, and it means infectious disease. Amazing. These people didn't know about infection. They had, they had, they had, no, they had little or no knowledge of what is in the blood and what is in the body fluids beyond the blood and the fluid. They didn't even know what vitamins were. Until, I, what was it, the late 1900s? So they certainly didn't understand. They knew you could catch something, but they didn't know, they did, infection was not something that they, that they knew about. Because even during the bubonic plague, plague, they never even told people to wash. 
That's one of the reasons that, that it traveled so fast. If you had somebody over and they ate your food and they were infected, they'd scrape the plate off, put it back in the cupboard. They didn't know any better. They didn't wash their hands before they prepared food. Go out and muck out the stalls. Then come in and fix the potatoes. <laughs> There's a lot of people who probably aren't going to eat lunch now. You be good. Don't make it worse. But think about this. That word, terror, infectious disease. God is way ahead of the curve in case you haven't figured it out. Be not afraid of sudden fear. Proverbs 3.26 says this, For the Lord shall be your confidence and keep your foot from being taken. In verse 1 in that of Proverbs, I mean, excuse me, of Psalm 91, he's going to tell you about the qualifications of the benefits of this psalm. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Then I will say, He is my refuge, my fortress, my God. In Him will I trust. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High. If you're dwelling in the secret place of the Most High, it said you are immediately abiding under the shadow of the Almighty. And because you are, you can say, You, God, are my refuge and my fortress, my God, and you I trust. For surely, verse 3, you deliver me from the snare of the fowler and the noisome pestilence. That word abide means to remain. It also means as one married to God's secret place. You're mar- How many of you realize you're married? Now, I, I don't want to get theologically controversial with you. But we are not the bride of Christ, according to Scripture. We're, all through Scripture, i got people looking at me like, what? Heresy, heresy. All through, all through the New Tra- Testament, what are we called? The body of who? Okay, who's the head? Be weird for God, the, the Father, to have just a female body and a male head. Is, what is, if, if Jesus is looking for a bride, that makes him the? Okay, then you go into the book of Revelations to the end of the book, and you're going to see when they talk about the new heaven and the new earth, and John writes and says, Behold, I see the bride of Christ descending, the, city, the heavenly city of Jerusalem. The bridegroom dwells with the bride. We're going to be citizens of Jerusalem. Jerusalem was designed for God's chosen people to reside. The city is the bride, and we are married to it. Why? Because we've been circumcised in the heart. He said, it's not, you're not a Jew outwardly, you're a Jew inwardly by the circumcision of the heart. Isn't that interesting? He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the, sh- shall, shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Now you can go and study that all you want, and that's okay. And the shadow of the Almighty, by the way, represents being sheltered and covered. Where it says, verse 3, Surely... He shall deliver me from the snare of the fowler. The actual word there is the trap. It's translated trap. He will deliver me from this trap. Fear presents a trap. And you've got to decide not to put your foot in it. The difference between 
If I'm going to trap a bear, well, not in Maine, but I mean, if I'm really trying to be a hunter, I set up a trap that the bear can't see, and he walks in it, and he gets trapped. He walks where he thinks it's safe. Oh, he misses, bang, he gets trapped. The devil traps us by fear. He tells us about the trap. He wants us to know about the trap. Why? Because he wants you afraid. Because the trap is not really the trap. It's a diversion. Fear is the trap. And you need to stay out of it. Now I want you to look at Psalm 92 since we're right there. And we're going to look at verses 12 through 14. Just one moment. Are you ready? I want you to see this, this video. But what happened to this man was he, he had uh, some type of a, uh, of a physical malady. So he went to the doctor and the doctor diagnosed him and gave him a prescription. Took the prescription, went to the pharmacy. They filled his prescription. It was the wrong medicine. He took it and it killed him. He died. Clinically declared dead. It's like they, it wasn't a fast. Nope, he ain't breathing. He's dead. He was declared dead. He went to heaven. And God spoke with him. And told him that this virus was about to hit the earth. Okay? And so, are you ready for him? Okay, go ahead, guys. My name is Joe Sober. I have a crucial word through divine revelation and visitation that would not serve the purposes of this writing, only to say this message has paramount importance for your presidency as well as the United States. The Lord revealed in a specific detail on November 12th at 10 a.m. what was about to happen across continents and the United States. God also showed me how it could be stopped. I'm about to share with you what I have been allowed to see. Suffice it to say, the following is crucial. This virus that has become an international epidemic, its course and effect, however, has been acutely disproportionate given other infections as the common flu. But therein lies a clue, and the reason for this communication. You see, the co coronavirus has been released from heaven. Yes, without a doubt, and with absolute resolve, God said that he is releasing a season of fear and panic. Notably, this current virus will not be like anything else before. Left unchecked, it will infiltrate every sector. How you, Mr. President, mitigate its effects will not be through billions in aid or medical experts racing to find a vaccine, although these measures are essential when there is nothing else. The financial markets will continue to destabilize as a harbinger or a warning of more to come. Catastrophic upheaval occurred this morning when he wrote that letter uh, as trading in the New York exchange was halted. This uh, communication was prepared two weeks ago. If our present situation reaches acute stages, a tipping point uh, with no return, we're witnessing a foretaste of what is to come between now and the summer. Millions of dollars have been set aside to combat uh, the virus. It'll be like water falling on ground. The extent of loss in the corporate and commercial centers due to a cessation of the money supply at the consumer and corporate level will be unstoppable. The business expansion that you have brought to the country will reverse. Jobs decline. Precious metals accelerate and inflation will increase due to a shortage of goods and services. Your presidency will be in jeopardy because the trajectory of this virus is far outrunning any medical or financial efforts to mitigate it. You are, as they say, 
holding a tiger, tiger by its tail. Furthermore, its lethal nature will accelerate the death count, and fear will grow acute within the belly of America, reach unprecedented proportions. People will quake with panic, as God said they would. You might ask, why would God do this? I prefer to outline what you can do to halt it in its tracks. What are you to do? The above question is why this writing has been forwarded to you. Mr. President, within the evangelical community, there is an unrelenting conviction that you are the highest office of the land by God. You are God's man for this season. You have been faithful in placing the U.S. Embassy in Jerusalem and recognizing Jerusalem as Israel's capital. What you have done in one full measure of authority was to fulfill prophecy and bring an area of biblical order back to the world. You have placed moral judges on the bench mm -hmm. and restored morality at the judicial level. But I believe God has placed before you your most significant victory yet one on the order of King Cyrus. It can be the measure of your greatest act, which will fuse the U.S. population to your side. In other words, it will ensure your next four years. Again, what am I to do? In the midst of this growing panic and fear and economic turbulence, God says, call a national day of prayer. This will not cause panic but relief and assurance, a call for a national day of prayer for God to protect your people. Recall you have been given the role of national steward and shepherd to the people of America. As you call for a national day of prayer, you will invoke the name and power of God Amen. while releasing the anointing of heaven that came with your ascendancy to the office. Ask God to protect our country and its people openly and boldly. God has revealed to me that as you call a national day of prayer, God will stop this in its tracks. Allow me to repeat this. God will stop it in its tracks. The economy will begin to get lit and buoyancy again. Panic and fear will recede. You will be assured the next four years and this presidency will be remembered on the order of Moses bringing the Israelites out of Egypt through a safe passage through the Red Sea. Right. President Trump, I know in your heart you're a man of God. I implore you to pray and consider what has been presented. Only you, President Trump, have the authority and persuasion before God. One of the greatest modern miracles of our time. God has given you this greatest gift. As countries will witness this miracle, you will bring healing to our nation, and America will be like a stream in the desert. Again, in an, o an oasis, an international honor for what you have done. Celeste just reminded me of something. We were at uh, with the Billy Brim conference. And Billy Brim was talking about the Orthodox rabbis in Israel, those people who study the word, those people who are sold out to God. We need to be careful in thinking just because they don't all recognize Jesus as Messiah yet, that they still don't hear, that they don't hear from God. God's still working with Israel. And she said, when the, when the rabbis begin talking about the last days, we better listen. Now, this man is also a Messianic rabbi. He obviously got the letter because today has been declared a national day of prayer. And he did that within the last couple of days. The man honors God. We better pay attention and honor God also. Tonight is intercessory prayer night. We're going to be praying along this, this line. As many as you as, as can possibly come, I don't care if it's an inconvenience or not, uh, dying's a lot bigger inconvenience and disobedience an even bigger one. So I would encourage you to come and pray with us.
If you cannot be here, and I didn't say if you don't want to, if you cannot be here, pray at home, 6 o'clock to 7 o'clock. It's not often you get a prophetic word and then see it manifesting in two days. Did you notice God spoke to him in November of last year? And in this letter, which was written over two weeks before he did this, he talked about the economic effect. Do you think the economy is hurting right now? JetBlue will not fly into Florida. Uh, Many other airlines have cut off flights, severely restricted flights. We've got a person uh, here, and and at least one, that was told from her, uh, their employees, their employer, that should they leave Maine, New Hampshire, or Vermont, when they come back, they're going to be put in, Two weeks of quarantine. If they're in, if they're if if they're in if they're out of, out of that area, or you go into New York, you go you go into Massachusetts, you got issues. Mass is one of the worst. So they're saying. I mean, this is how the world is looking at this. This is how the world is looking at it. Um, schools closed. Students can't go anywhere. They were all excited. Oh, great! We're going to have a great spring vacation. Not when you can't get there. And if you think that Florida is going to allow a mass influx of students from all over the country when they are one of the worst states right now, you're going to have a lot of people looking to see if the if Reed State Park's open if they want to get to a beach. <laughs> Restaurants are closing. These students here in water, but we need to pray for our economy in the area. University of Maine and Augusta, uh, our Colby, Thomas, uh, I don't know about Unity. Uh, Unity's closed. Okay. Uh, I, I, I don't expect, I'm not sure what the, what the uh, public schools are going to do, but I, I'd be very surprised if they don't get very long breaks. Uh, they, they're shutting them down. These students are going home. All of these restaurants and, and businesses now that have been thriving uh, on the fact and, and counting on student monies, that's, go, that's dried up. Bang. Overnight. And this is happening all over the country. People, people are, are, large manufacturing plants are shutting down to skeleton crew. If this goes on for any length of time, there, there's going to be a lot of bankrupt businesses. We're, exactly what this, what this rabbi was shown by the Lord. Now, I know a lot of you did not like when he said that God sent the coronavirus. I mean, you, I, I could sense you know, people bristling, we faith people. All you got to do is read the Bible. A lot of places God sent or God allowed. I prefer to believe he allowed. But he told him, I'm sending it. We're in, the, we're in the last times anyway, y'all. And there are a lot bigger things that are actually going to be sent that come out of heaven. The four horsemen of the apocalypse ride out of heaven. How many of you, you say, well, we can't be in the last days yet. Do you not remember the constellation where Virgo, the virgin, had Jupiter... The king planet was Jupiter, yes? King planet? On its trajectory, come, and and, because remember in Revelations it said you're going to see a sign in the heavens. The virgin shall, shall give birth to a child. Jupiter comes and it enters the constellation Virgo in the belly area. It does, because of the trajectory, now everything's moving, from our view, it looks like Jupiter is coming straight at us. So for nine months, Jupiter stayed in the belly of the constellation Virgo, the Virgin. At the end of nine months, it exited 
through the birth canal. Just go to Revelations. That's one of the signs of the last days, people. Revelations 12. We all think everything is in order in the book of Revelations, but it's not. It's not. It, you're getting pieces as he was shown, but it's not necessarily chronological order. But it is the last days. It's part of the last days, the beginning of the time of sorrows. It was, it, it, and it, it was started and, and is considered the beginning of what's called Jacob's Troubles, which is Israel being severely harassed and judged. Harassed by its enemies and judged. Right now in, in, in Israel, you can't have a gathering of more than 100 people. And that's across the country. Restaurants are closed. Schools are closed by order of the government. Uh, they, they, it's strict. It's strict. But you also notice God's enemies are getting hit. A good portion of Iran's government higher level government officials have tested positive. China, where this came from, is being devastated. Everybody's telling you they've got it under control. Rodney Howard Brown has friends there and was actually con contacted by one of the scientists who worked in that facility. And he said they're lying about what's going on. He said it's far, far worse. He also told him that the virus was genetically engineered. Now I want you to think about the, how evil this is. It was engineered to, to work at its fullest capacity in Mongolians and Chinese. Why would you want... You, they want the Mongolians dead because Mongolia has resisted since China became com communist, and they still resist. They're a thorn in their flesh. See, they follow the Dalai Lama, and as long as the Dalai Lama is alive or, the, or his replacement has come, they're having problems. They want the Mongolians gone. The, they want the Chinese gone. They have over a billion, 300 million people. To devise a virus that kills your own is about as evil as evil can get. And yet, the judgment is falling on them. God's giving us an avenue out. Not to be, for us to be afraid, but for us to remember who we are and what our purpose is. We're here to usher in the coming of the Lord during times of great difficulty. During times of great difficulty. What's that, Celeste? Yes. Amen. Now, Psalm 92, verses 12 through 14. This is for those of you who are in, quote unquote, the high danger zone. What age group is this supposed to be affecting the worst? Older people. Yeah, they, they, they don't understand that you can be older in Christ and still be 40. That's, that's their problem. Uh, but I want you to look. God had plans for the older people as well. Verse 12. The righteous shall flourish like a palm tree. They shall grow like a cedar in Lebanon. Cedars are tall and, and resistant. Those who are planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish. I need a piece of paper this size, plain, uh, empty, please. Shall flourish in the courts of our God. They shall bear fruit, now listen closely, in old age. They shall be fresh and flourishing. 
That word, that word vigorous and sturdy shall they be in the King James means fat. Fat is... No, no, no. Listen closely. Fat means prosperous and blessed. Fat means prosperous and blessed. Flourishing. It also means green as fresh with fruit. In other words, when a believer hits his senior years, he's still able to produce fruit. Sarah and Abraham were an example. John the Baptist's parents were an example. Out of the mouth of two or three witnesses, let a word be established. Listen, if your husbands get frisky, ladies, if you don't want to have another kid, bat him down. Uh, he may be standing on that promise. Well, I'm past the time of delivery. <laughs> that was said before. Didn't work. Hello, John. I, I want to show you something that, that just blew my mind. Got a pen? Who's got a pen? Or, or, yeah, thank you. I'm, I'm going to show you something incredibly interesting in just a second. Uh, that word fat, that also means f that... that uh, Vigorous and sturdy means full of sap and moisture. A tree, limber arms, sap flows like a maple tree when it's tapped. Fruitful in every good work, meaning your ministry is to increase, not decrease as a believer, the older you get. It's not, there is no retirement for a believer. In the work of the Lord. Amen. Minister, fivefold or not, we're all in the ministry. Who gets this? Well, what does it say? Let's take, let's take another look at it. Those, verse 12. Uh, where am I? 92. Here we go. The righteous, those who are planted. Somebody read that to, to the King James for me. Go ahead, Nance. The righteous shall flourish like a palm tree, and shall grow like a cedar in Lebanon. Those that are planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our Good, right there. Those who are planted in the house of the Lord. Now, there is an archaic form of Hebrew that was written in pictographs, like the Chinese. They, they don't have an alphabet as you and I know it. They have pictures. I'm going to show you the symbol for, for house. Anybody see that? Oh, you're good. You're good. I was going to ask you before that. Got, no, he won't carry that. Am I wrong? Everybody see that? Okay, that's a typical word in archaic Hebrew for house. In this verse, those that are planted where? In the house. Of God. This is how it's written. This is Old Testament, y'all. This is it, house. In this verse, in the house of the Lord. Wow. 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 Great, 
Yeah, no temple there. No. That's the cross. Yeah. For such a time as this. We are near. We are near. Those that are planted in the house of the Lord. That word planted means transplanted or, listen close, or grafted into a vine. This is for believers in Christ. Amen. I'm getting excited. It all transpla- It means, when it says the house of the Lord, it means family oh, or temple on the inside. What are you? Those that are planted in the house of the Lord Christ on the inside. Greater is he that's in you. This is a New Testament prophetic word for times like today. It blows, I'm sorry, I get excited. This is, he also says, it's crazy cool. If you go back to Psalm 91, verse 3. Surely he shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler. Remember we talked about the trap earlier. And from the noisome pestilence. pestilence. The noisome pestilence. That word noisome means... Count or number, measurement from the source of its origin. All we've been getting from the news media is numbers. How many, how many, how many affect, how many contacted, how many infected, how many dead. This everything about this noisome pestilence is numbered. To frighten us. Worldwide. Numbers, 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 numbers. You don't get numbers anymore about cancer or things like that. You just, you, they just they don't do it. But this thing, you notice it's being built up. It's being hyped. It's being advertised. Where do you think advertising came from? The enemy. <laughs> Stole from God. God advertises His truth through signs, wonders, and the Word. The devil uses the media. Hallelujah. So can God praise the name. But it's numbers. The word pestilence means mischief. Or a corrupt, corrupted perversion. Chemical warfare is a corrupted perversion of a normal germ. So the Lord is saying, those that are, in this, that are residing in this house are going to be pr- protected from this numerous perversion. Anybody think that this might have been particularly written for these kind of events in the life of a believer? It's for anyone who lives by faith. That's why David... And people like Abraham were protected because they were looking forward to. They had all their faith in the coming of the Messiah. And it was counted for, to them as righteousness. And they were excited. That's why they were waiting in paradise for the fulfillment. That's why they couldn't leave and go to heaven. But they were in paradise because they trusted He gave them plenty of signs. The serpent on the pole. When when he told all the tribes how to set themselves up when they'd stop for a while. This tribe here that put them here, put them here, put them here, put them here. If you went up on a mountain, all the tribes of Israel, the way they were put out, each, each person in his tribe, that's where they stayed in squares. It looked like a cross. Not a plus sign, a cross. Everything has been looking forward. This is our time, y'all. 
This is not, not just the time for attacks, but this is the time for miraculous overthrow of the enemy's plans for those who love the Lord, for those who are called according to his purpose, and for those who believe the message and receive the Lord as their Savior. They're going to have a house that they can, that's covered that they can run into. This is our time for ministry. It said he will deliver. Psalm 91 and verse 11 says, For he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all of your ways. All of your ways he shall keep you. You could say it this way. The word ways is talking about your course of life, your day-to-day journeys, the directions you take by the decisions you make. In other words, there's not one part of your 24-hour day that he isn't watching over you. Every decision you make, even stupid one, during the course of your day, no matter, in other words, he's not surprised by anything. It's already planned out how, that he will be there to protect you. The word all means complete, including your choices. Completely. Everything, including symptoms. Just because you get a symptom does not mean you've got the coronavirus. And even if you have a symptom of the coronavirus, it is not to have you. You come against, oh, I've got the symptom, I've got the virus, that's right. Open your mouth and take possession. Thus shall my word be that goeth forth. Say, no, you trying, Bubba, but in Jesus' name, hit the road. Say, but I did that and it got worse. I don't care. You stand. You stand. I had somebody say, they were sick, they thought they had the coronavirus. They didn't. They, 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 uh, he better not had. He, but he didn't. But you know what? It's so much on the news. And it's, a, they've got it like, they've got it like a secret agent in, in the germ world. That it's all around you. It's just waiting to jump out from behind a bush. Mains loaded with it. It's just holding back, lulling people into a false sense of security so you can jump out and bite them. No, I'm sorry. No, not for a believer. That word, that word all means from start, from the start to the finish of the threat. He, all your ways He will keep you. Before you and I knew there was a threat, he was already keeping us. If you're hiding in the secret place of the Most High. It says he will guard you in all your ways, right? That's what it means to keep. Keep you. It means to guard and protect. To take care of you. Somebody find me uh, in King James, Isaiah 30, 21. And somebody else find Psalm 4 8. Who's got Isaiah 30 21 in King James? Let me see hands. Just Nancy. Go ahead. Do you think he's got you covered? You're going to hear the voice. Whose voice is it going to be? Not the devil. His voice. You're going, to, you're going to be going, oh, I think I'll go this way. You're going to hear, uh-uh. No, you're going to go this way. But this way is shorter. I don't care. How obedient can you be? Go left. Yeah, but it's shorter. I want to get there quicker. Holy Spirit saying, I'd like you to go left. But you can go whatever way you want. So if you go right to satisfy yourself, don't be surprised if you stumble over something that you weren't paying attention to 
and stub your big toe. Psalm 4, verse 8. Josh, go ahead. I will both lay me down in peace and sleep, for thou, Lord, only makest me dwell in safety. You better, when your head hits the pillow, thank God for sweet sleep and not lay there wondering how it's going to get to you. Amen. Come on. And don't tell me that doesn't happen to you. If your life is spent thinking about all the negatives of your life, if, if, if you, oh, I love God, but I'm just one of those people where if something's going to go wrong, it will. You know, what can go wrong will go wrong, yeah. Oh, yeah, Eeyore, there you go. That's the only part of Christopher Robin stories I wasn't crazy about. Poor dumb Eeyore. And if you ever noticed, no, nothing that Eeyore ever worried about affected anybody but Eeyore. Might be good for you to read that. It could be a bright, beautiful day and, and his birthday. And he expects to ruin the present or the cake to fall apart or nobody to show up. I always get whatever's going around. You want it, you come up here. If you really believe that, I'm going to have an altar call after service. And every negative thing you believe, I want you to come up and get in line. I'm going to anoint you with oil. And in the name of Jesus, I'm going to agree that you get exactly what you say. Then you tell me you want to come up and be prayed for. Hallelujah. I'm going to lay me down in peace and sleep. Meaning, that word sleep means R-E-S-T. You wake up in the morning and you feel better. So you're saying, okay, pastor, what, what's our job? You've got to understand something. Since we don't have to worry about getting the virus... But there's a whole wide world out there that does because they don't know about their protection in Jesus or they don't have Jesus. Those of us who have both have a job to do. There is a, we blew it once already. When those twin towers went down, the body of Christ blew it. We should have been out in the streets in mass witnessing to Christ, bringing people to the Lord, but the church was not ready. And it, that opportunity went right by. And God knows how many people who might have had an opportunity to come to the Lord have departed from this planet and are not in heaven. I don't want to answer for that with this. You and I have a job. And it's the very same job as Noah. I want you to turn to 2 Peter chapter 2. 2 Peter chapter 2. Just about done. Okay. Well, let's, let's start with verse 4. For if God did not spare the angels who sinned, but cast them down... This is good. But God did not spare the angels who sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved for judgment... Listen, and did not spare the ancient world, but saved Noah, one of eight people. Now they're going to describe what his job was besides building the ark. A preacher of righteousness. He didn't just spend a whole hundred years building a boat where there was no water. He had people come to make fun of him. You read some of the old Jewish historical books. People came from all over that civil that world to make fun and laugh and he would preach the word of righteousness to them repent yeah. repent change there's a flood coming that boat was big enough to take care of a lot of people but you know god gave him specific measurements cuz he knew who was going to receive it and who wasn't you and i have an opportunity to bring some people into the ark of Christ. Because Christ, Christ's sacrifice hadn't taken place when he preached. And, and, and my Bible says Jesus is delaying the last days because he wants as much as he can get. He wants as much of the precious fruit of the earth as is possible. It's your opportunity to share Christ. 
So I don't know how to witness. Tell them what a skunk you used to be and how you're not now or how you're progressing. Tell them how God removed your scent gland, your sin gland. Amen? Made you a sweet pet. They say skunks, once their, once their uh, scent gland has been removed, make one of the best pets in the world. Did you know that? They're lovely. They're gentle. And what you see is what you get. That's what they need from you believers. That's what they need from you and I. They need the gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. You and I had to, to, to preach righteousness. Barnes' commentary said this, Noah's job was to warn the world of the coming judgment. That's what we're supposed to be doing during this time, not worrying about us getting it. We're supposed to be warning people. There is a place you can go for protection. There is, a pl- there is something you can do even though there is no vaccination. I'm going to tell you something. And, and, and then I'll give you one scripture and we're done. Everybody who's waiting for a flu vaccine is waiting in vain. And I'm going to tell you why. Anybody who has any science background, viruses morph. And when they hit something that is resistant to them, over time, if they have a host that they, that they can work, they will change in order to overcome what's resisting them. And so the flu they pass on to another person is not the same flu that maybe originally hit them. Not only is that, but they're also sneaky. Some flus don't kill everybody that they, that they infect. Some of them just use them to ride around so they can give it to other people. They're, they're hosts. They're carriers. So you could get, somebody in California could discover a vaccine for the, 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 the type of uh, coronavirus that, that hit California and send it to New York and by the time it hits New York, it may have morphed so that it doesn't work well. They're going to have to discover another way to change it. There's only one flu shot that you can get that will take care of you no matter what. That's right, the blood of Jesus. You need to get saved and you need to stand fast in the liberty. But he was wounded for your transgressions. He was bruised for your iniquities and mine. The chastisement of our peace was laid upon him. And with his stripes we were healed. And if we were, then we are. Now turn to Galatians chapter 5. No, 2 Timothy, excuse me. 2 Timothy Hallelujah. 2 Timothy chapter 1. If you're not sure where it is, it's just before Titus. If you know where Titus is and don't know where Timothy is, my hat off to you. It's two books before Hebrews. 2 Timothy chapter 1. And this is what I'm going to close with. And then I'm going to pray a prayer over all of you. Verses 7 and 8. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Therefore, whenever you see the word therefore, you want to find out what it's there for. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but one of power and of love and of a sound mind. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord nor of me, his prisoner, but share with me in the sufferings for the gospel according to the power of God. Meaning, suck it up if they call you a religious freak. That's, 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 the, that's the attacks that we get. You may get ridiculed for preaching the gospel. But Paul said, suck it up. Why? 
the reward far outweighs the little bit of harassment you're going to feel <laughs> for, and, and the little bit of embarrassment you may feel. But all my friends, I'll ruin my reputation. Hallelujah. <laughs> you shouldn't have those kind of friends anyway. <laughs> Amen.